Peter Van Hardenberg is a principal investigator at uh, Inc. and Switch Labs. And before joining Inc. and Switch, Peter worked on building cloud platforms like Heroku and games for handheld consoles, and also as a field research oceanographer. So clearly we have um, a very well-rounded set of speakers today. He lives in the beautiful San Francisco, California. Um, and I added that beautiful there, Peter, because I just love it so much. But um, Peter, I'm just gonna go ahead and, and let you get started whenever you're ready. So thank you so much for coming today. Great, yeah. Uh, can you throw the screen share to me? Yep. Yeah. And there we go, can you see that okay? Yeah, it looks good. Fantastic. Okay, so uh, thanks so much for having me here. I'm I'm really delighted to get a chance to come and talk about this. Uh, and what I'm going to do is try and give just a really quick tour of a concept we've been uh, researching at the lab now for some time. Uh, we call it local first software, and I'm going to talk a little bit about why we think it's important, um, how how we're approaching the problem, and then how uh, hopefully you can get some benefit from this thinking as well uh, going forward in the future. So before trying to explain what we think local first software is, I want to start by sort of framing the problem a little bit. Um, I, you know, are you tired of outages? I'm tired of outages. You know, it feels like every day something new is down. Uh, you know, S3 is down, EC2 is on the fritz. It, it doesn't matter. Slack has, you know, some Kafka queue and Slack goes sideways and suddenly you can't talk to your coworkers anymore. Uh, I, I do this all the time. I occasionally make the mistake of trying to use my computer, um, you know, on boats uh, in my former life as an Arctic oceanographer. Computers don't work very well on boats because they don't have internet connections, uh, particularly in the Arctic. Uh, but we don't have to go to the Arctic to uh, lose Wi-Fi. You can just get on a train. This is the, the N Judah runs outside my house. Uh, here in San Francisco. But honestly, oh, and the image isn't loading. Uh, but I have this problem in my house, in my kitchen, uh, just, you know, if I walk into, there's a spot, uh, which I'm sorry, I don't know why the picture's not loading, uh, in my kitchen by my refrigerator, where often I will put my laptop, because it's the best place to put my laptop with a recipe on it if I'm cooking. And there's just no Wi-Fi there. The number of times that I just lose my network entirely uh, is really frustrating. You know, today your laptop without a network connection is basically one of these. You know, it's just, it's a heavy, solid object. You could use it to, you know, bludgeon a home invader or to, uh, you know, flatten uh, something that was uneven, uh, but it's not terribly useful as a computer. But it's not just this sort of like network connectivity that, that can cause problems. You know, we have, we have outages and downtimes because this DevOps problem is so hard. We've built these big pieces of infrastructure that then we struggle to, to keep online. But we also have what I would call a business outage. And, and so, you know, there's this whole category of blog posts. They call them the incredible journey blog posts. And I'm personally really tired of my software taking these incredible journeys and leaving me behind. But here's a, a really recent example. This is a, a great weather app called Dark Sky, Sky, and they have some you know, important and exciting news to share with us. Oh, good. I can't wait to find out what it is. They've joined Apple. Oh, uh, cool. And the app will no longer be available for download. But, but I, I was using that. And it's not just Dark Sky. You know, and it's not just Google with Inbox and Reader. And, you know, there's a whole blog post. I've put the link at the bottom there, incrediblejourney.tumblr.com, which, which collects all of these posts from founders telling you what an incredible journey it's been and how you're about to lose this piece of software that you've built into your life and come to rely on. Hopefully you're convinced that there's a problem here. And the problem on some level could be the cloud. But let's talk a little more about it. So I have a solution. I have found a great piece of software. It's, uh, it's local first software. This is uh, WordStar 4.0. It's actually what George Martin uses to write those Game of Thrones books. And you know, it never goes down. There's no outages. Uh, you know, you can, I mean, if you have a, you know, strong arms, you can carry this computer around your house and plug it in anywhere. You don't have to worry about Wi-Fi <coughs> connection. Uh, but you know, the graphics aren't that great. So let's upgrade the graphics just a little bit. Never had any outages here. I'm not quite sure what version of Internet Explorer this is, but uh, no matter, you know, I'm, I'm pretty sure that we won't have any outages. 
Okay, well, you know, I realize that this is not the most convincing argument. We don't want to go back to the, you know, 30 years ago world of computing. But what I do want to highlight is actually, what's the big leap forward between those old products, other than obviously um, literal physical weight of the computers they run on? Uh, and I think one of the key differences is actually highlighted in a big transition that's been happening in the design space, which is the world has moved from uh, using a great piece of software that, that I've really admired for a long time called Sketch to a new piece of software called Figma. And Figma is cloud-based and Sketch is a classic legacy desktop app. Now we can parse all the features of vector networks and everything else. And if you're like me and occasionally have to dabble in some design work, you, you, know, you kind of have preferences about one set of features or the other. But I think the real difference between these two uh, is uh, highlighted by this um, well-known American musician, uh, Vanilla Ice. Uh, and it really boils down to a question of collaboration. You know, if I make something in Figma, I can just, you know, send someone a link, they can open it up, they don't have to download something, I don't have to worry about if they're on mobile or they're on a Windows PC or a Linux machine. You know, they don't have to pay a hundred bucks for a license just to see what I'm doing. They can just open up a browser window and we can collaborate and have a conversation. And in this time where most of us are at home, this is more important than ever. So this is the heart of what we call local first software, which is what we want to do and what we're advocating for is to try and solve this problem as a, as a larger technical and software community and to bring together kind of the benefits of the old world and the benefits of the new. We want to have this like robust collaboration environment, but we also want to have uh, these properties of software that we've lost. Uh, and so we're going to look at sort of two different wings of this. First, I'm going to talk a little bit briefly about some of the research that we're doing in our, our lab. Uh, and then I also want to talk a little bit for, because that stuff's, uh, you know, research software. It's, it's, I wouldn't recommend it for production today. But I want to talk a little bit about some of the kind of practical techniques I hope that uh, some of you will be able to adopt in your own work and, and sort of give some thoughts on that. Um, so let's begin with the purest edition because that's more fun. And uh, if uh, coronavirus allows it, you can come to my talk in October, hopefully. We're gonna talk a lot more about all the like exciting and interesting computer science that underlies all of this, and that'll be a lot of fun. Um, but so I'm gonna show you a project we've been working on called Pushpin. The idea behind Pushpin, and we have a whole blog post about local first software you can read, but also here uh, we published a paper in partnership with Martin Kleppman, um, uh, sort of the Cambridge University computer science researcher about some of this stuff. Uh, and Pushpin is our attempt to kind of bring together uh, a holistic solution to all of these problems under one roof. And so Pushpin is a piece of software. It's a React app. Uh, it stores all the data locally. And these are kind of our, our key points, I think, that, that you, know, you can say, if you have a local first piece of software, it should do these things. So you should have data locally. <laughs> You know, it's all well and good to download the program, but then if you go and try and use the program and it relies on a cloud API just to take over, well, that's not much use, is it? So you need to actually, you know, there's probably more data out there in the world than we can fit in our tiny little laptops. But for the data that a user uses, that they're touching, that they're seeing, you want to download that and keep it locally. That way they can keep working. Um, Pushpin supports offline synchronization between your devices. It can talk over directly between two computers, like an old school you know, like Game of Doom over a LAN party style connection. It doesn't actually need any internet servers to collaborate. Um, every part of the software is, has built-in real-time collaboration. Uh, and actually, that's pretty cool. It uh, uh, means that, you know, when I'm working on software built on this stack, I don't have to think about, you know, oh, you know, how am I going to sync this? When does this API request go back? And we can talk a little bit about how that works. And it's it's peer-to-peer. -peer, so, you know, if even if I'm making a connection with you, you know, from my home here in San Francisco to maybe you're there in Malaga, you know, we're it's actually our computers are talking directly to each other through the network. And that's the original design of the internet, right? But we've kind of lost the habit of taking advantage of it as a as a community because we've put all these sort of big steel centralized cloud infrastructure in between them. Um, you know, it's installed locally. That means that I can rely on it to be there. You know, it it sticks around. Um, it's secure and private because I don't have to worry that, you know, you don't, if you use this, you don't have to worry that I'm going to be reading your data or selling it or, you know, like data mining on it to, to, for whatever nefarious or not nefarious purposes I have. Because it's only in your computer and in the computers of uh, people who you share the data with and collaborate with. 
Um, now there's asterisks there because this is research software and there's a bunch of holes in the, the model right now. So uh, we can talk more about that on a, in a, the full version of the talk for people who are interested. But one of the things that I think is really cool about this is this is a React app. You know, this is a React app. I've built it. It runs in Electron. And if you download and install it, it's yours. You know, like, yeah, it's open source. But there's lots of sort of ostensibly open source software out there that can kind of fall off the internet. You know, if you use Apache Wave or Google Wave or whatever, when Google stopped maintaining it, it's gone. You know, if you download and install Pushpin and you find that it works for you, it's yours for as long as you want to use it. You can trust that it will be there when you need it because I can't take it down because it runs on your computer. Now that said, it is research software. I would not hurry out to install Pushpin uh, and start loading all your most valuable data into it. Um, you know, we're working always on improving the reliability of the system, but uh, it, I would, this is research. So just to speak briefly about how this works, basically what we have is a simple web app, but in your classic sort of three-tier architecture, you have your web app, then you have an API, and then you have a database. What we've done is basically replace the API and database with these other two technologies, AutoMerge and DAT. So AutoMerge is a CRDT, that's a conflict-free replicated data type, which is a bunch of uh, comp sci jargon. The best way to think about the problem that AutoMerge solves is that it is like a, a Git repository for a data structure. So instead of checking in files and then changing lines, you check in a document and then you change fields in the document. So I can insert elements into an array instead of adding or removing a line. And if you ever had like an array of JSON, you know, you're inserting things with Git, you can get conflicts because like, oh, it forgets to add a comma at the end, or both of you inserted something at the end, and technically that's a conflict. So what's great about um, AutoMerge is because it operates not on the structure of the text representation of the data, but on the data itself, you get much higher fidelity ability to merge changes from different places. And then DAT uh, represents, which is a great open source community project we've been working with for a number of years, it actually handles data distribution. You can think about it like uh, you know, BitTorrent in a business suit. Uh, the idea is that uh, DAT is a system of data structures that work as append-only logs, kind of like a decentralized Kafka. I can write records onto the end of my work log, and then you can download them from anywhere, and you get validation. You know, DAT provides the infrastructure both to connect our computers together, and then mechanisms that allow us to validate that the data we're downloading from somebody is the data we expect to get. So that looks kind of like this. So I have, you know, here on the right, I've got this user interface, which is a React app. And then when I, sorry, my, when I make changes here, uh, you know, I click on something or I type something in, then that goes into sort of a Redux React style store in the front end. And then we just call render and then we get that back. And that's just like a classic single page app, React, Redux kind of, you know, user interface loop. What's happening that's different here is that whenever we make changes, we instrument the data structure, and then we collect those changes, we write them into sort of a local work log, and then we can push those through the network to other people. And we can also receive those changes back from other people, and they arrive in this data structure and then merge with everybody else's work, hence the name auto-merge, and then that propagates back up. So if you make a change or I make a change, it doesn't really matter. From the perspective of the app, it comes out the same way. And this is a super powerful abstraction and is kind of you know, the great enabling sort of realization that, that lets us do a lot of this work. We can talk a lot more about this. I've literally spent years of my life on it, and uh, I'm happy to take questions about it. But uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to keep moving, and we're going to talk a little bit about uh, uh, some other things. Now, I do want to call attention to a few um, important points. This is a picture from Mars from Curiosity rover looking over its shoulder, I believe. Maybe it's Pathfinder. Um, you know, we're kind of entering a brave new world as we work on this stuff. And, you know, uh, there are a number of things that we've learned don't really work that well yet. Uh, CRDTs, this auto merge data structure that we're working on, it's relatively new and it's relatively immature. We've gone through three orders of magnitude. That's a thousand X performance improvements in the last two years. We have another hundred X coming. Uh, so hopefully by the end of the year, I'll feel quite confident using these in sort of larger scale production deployments. But you know, from a performance perspective, there are definitely applications where it's quite suitable and works well, but uh, there are places where it's challenged. Uh, I will note, though, that one sort of common misgiving people have is they say, oh, this thing must have so much overhead and be so complicated and have so much data. Most users don't really have that much data. 
It's only when you take everybody's data and pool it together into one big place and then try and query over all of it and maintain transactional integrity over all of it, your problems get hard. You know, the Slack channels that I type in with my hands, the amount of data I can create is really limited by how fast I can move these sort of like meat uh, sticks on some switches. You know, it's not a lot of sort of big data in the classical sense. One challenge that we've spent a lot of energy on and continue to research is that, you know, due to sort of, I guess, the legacy of, um, you know, file sharing and sort of uh, being used for, let's say, uh, copyright questionable purposes, uh, many institutional environments have become downright hostile in like a network infrastructure postural sense to peer-to-peer uh, -peer connections because historically you know all of the sort of legitimate business work was happening over a centralized piece of infrastructure and if you saw a peer-to-peer -peer connection it could be a virus or it might be a BitTorrent connection or some other kind of inappropriate or, or even downright nefarious activity and so the original kind of like infrastructure design of the internet it, you know TCP IP was built around these peer connections but we've kind of lost the habit and so in a lot of institutional environments We've discovered a lot of interesting challenges and we're making progress there, but I wanted to call that out as an issue. And the last thing I, I kind of point out is like, there's a reason that people's web apps don't succeed on mobile in general. And the answer is that web technology is really slow. And we could do a whole talk on this as well, but we won't. But basically, uh, you know, native apps for iOS and Android really prioritize elimination of jank. And jank is when you drop frames because things are slow. You know, you, you have sort of hiccups in scrolling and so on. Web technology really struggles to maintain performance and keep that rock solid 60 frames per second responsiveness, uh, you know, even when you're running it locally. So great, we can save 100 milliseconds of latency by not having to round trip all the way to US East 1, you know, which is far from all of us on this call right now. Uh, because it's on the east coast of the United States. So you're going across the Atlantic, I'm going across America, we're all miserable. But uh, you know, we still end up burning multiple frames of latency, you know, so our typing feels sluggish and our interactions feel bad, just because it takes so long to relay out HTML and manipulate DOM. And that's an area that we continue to work on, and, and, but it's something to be conscious of as a challenge. So, okay, but you know, I don't wanna leave you sort of with the answer that like, oh, local first software is impossible. We live in this like, you know, miserable uh, environment where nothing can get better. So I'll give you a few pragmatic thoughts uh, for today. First, and maybe most obvious, even if you don't really think of your software as being like an offline centric or sort of locally centric piece of software, start by designing and testing your offline usage early. Slack, sure, you could say, oh, it's chat software. Why would you need this offline? I'll tell you why you need this offline. I was flying into uh, a team summit. I work as a distributed team. And on the plane, I went to look up what my hotel was because I'd posted it in the Slack. And I saw this instead because I'd closed my laptop and when I reopened it, Slack went to reload. And I pick on Slack because I have friends who work there and, and you know, it's such a part of all of our lives. But just because your software is primarily used online doesn't mean that the data that you're downloading into users' computers is something you should throw away. Is that important principle that like if you've seen something you should still have it tomorrow so keep a local copy of the data that your users use and the code that they need so if somebody sees something don't throw it away that's that's a good principle and if you're building you know for uh, mobile apps like android and ios there's actually a lot of great examples of software built this way if you're building for the web uh you know the state of the art is pwa these are progressive web apps and this is basically a standard uh, set of practices and some extra technologies that let you sort of tell the browser like, hey, this bit here, you know, we're gonna need you to hang on to the CSS file. If you get these kinds of requests, like we'll cache the responses for those. And here's how you can like actually work when the web is either too slow or unavailable. And remember, you don't need to be on an airplane for the web to go away. In my house, you just need to stand in the kitchen in the right spot. So please think about that. And you know, just while we're at it, don't do this. I hate when people do this. Don't just take your web app and then like put a React Native frame around it and then just load it. That's not a mobile app. I mean, I get it. We all have engineering budgets. And we're all in a hurry and we got a lot to do. But like when you start from this place, it's really hard to get somewhere good. Your app is always going to be buggy and slow and it's, it's always going to be kind of problematic if you start from this foundation. Unless maybe if you build a, a PWA. That's interesting. 
well, let me know if you try that and that works for you. So, okay, fine. I've given you a little spiel about local first software, and but does this really matter? You know, does is this actually something that you should prioritize in your team? And you know, I want you to sort of let's go back to Jeff Raskin, the the creator of the the Macintosh project. The system should treat all user input as sacred. I, I think this is a good guiding principle in our work and in, in, our, in our sort of professional design ethics. It's something we should be aware of. You know, when you take a user's work and you throw it away, that is just a violation of the trust and and uh, belief that the user puts in you. And oh, it's not showing the images for some reason. You know, you, there's an invisible tax on our applications, and well, maybe this is a good example, right? That there should be an image of uh, of an airport line. Do you think your users are going to report when your software doesn't work in the airport queue? No, of course not. You know, they just our expectations have been so degraded. We are so debased that we live in this like a uh, disappointing failure state all the time as we wander around in the world, and we don't even notice because we become accustomed to it. You know, if your software doesn't work for a user who's standing in the airport security line when they go to check their reservation or see when their you know, flight's going to be or their next appointment, you won't hear about it. So this, there are undoubtedly, if you aren't doing this work, there are undoubtedly people suffering from your failure every day that you just don't hear from. And well, I have more data loss again. This can lead to irrevocable losses. Um, I was in a band in my misspent youth and like many people my uh, age, we put our music up on MySpace so that nobody could listen to it. Uh, well, MySpace lost that data. Now, I'm lucky. I still have a copy on a hard drive somewhere, but I know other people who aren't. And you know, when we rely on these cloud services and when we build them, we have a burden of care, I believe, to think about the long-term consequences of the system architectures we're building and the kinds of experiences we're giving people. Because when we fail, and failure is inevitable, when businesses end, when you know, servers literally fall out of the back of a truck, uh, then that can lead to losses that our users can't come back from. And especially in the case of creative works, it's one thing to lose, you know, oh, I lost you know, like the, uh, the receipt for the order for my groceries. But when you're dealing with people's creative work, their sort of most personal work, then I think that's an especially great tragedy. So I hope you'll consider this. Um, I hope you will uh, come to my talk uh, uh, and we can talk more about CRDTs and computer science in person uh, uh, when we are in uh, person together someday. But in the meantime, if you want to learn more about this or look more at these things, you can talk to me on Twitter. You can send me an email. We've got this lovely essay on our Ink and Switch webpage where we talk all about local first software and go into 6,000 words of detail about it. And there's lots of code that you can look at and try both on our uh, labs webpage and also the AutoMerge community. AutoMerge is available in JavaScript, TypeScript, and now uh, very recently in Rust. So uh, thanks for listening. I went about two minutes over time, but I know we had a little extra, so I stole it. Uh, I'd be happy to take your questions. Is, is there a protocol with questions? Sorry, I've, I've only just turned up recently. <clears throat> you just ask away. So yeah, I was, I was going to ask about um, UI issues with uh, with this sort of uh, with the collaborative software. For instance, if um, if I'm working on a list and you delete that list, or uh, and you know just just generally seems like there be, must be a lot of UI um, idioms that we're going to need to develop uh, that perhaps don't <clears> exist yet, or maybe they. Are and I haven't seen them yet. Uh, basically, that. Yeah, great. I, this is a wonderful question. Um, so there's a few sort of uh, ways to answer this. One is that you know if you use um, modern collaborative software like Figma or Google Docs or whatever, you know, yes, uh, you know, if you're editing a piece of, of you know a Google Sheet or some slides with someone and they're typing in a text box, don't delete it. Right. We have this innate human understanding of the consequences of our actions and a natural tendency to be thoughtful about um, uh, other people's needs when we are collaborating. And you know, that's maybe a little bit of a, of a seems like a cop-out answer, but it was a problem that we were really worried about as we started this work. And what we discovered sort of empirically through building software and testing it with people is that while we remain concerned about it, you know, it, it, no one has complained and we haven't observed real problems in our own 
uh, work. So that's just interesting. Now, to answer the question about you know what are the kinds of UI paradigms and so on, we call this the boing problem because you know you'd be working away and then someone comes online with their edits and then boing, all of your data's gone. It'd be very uh, dislocative. Um, so we don't have a lot of uh, examples in our, our research that I can point to to show this. But what we have under the hood with the systems we've been building, you know, like Git, we retain the full history of the document you're editing. And Google Docs does this too. This isn't rocket surgery. You know, so it, when you have these kinds of problems, you have the full history. You can step back in time. You, know, you can have conflict resolution. You can sort of pick and choose how you want to deal with these things. But I do agree that sort of generally speaking, there are going to be interesting problems that emerge around this as we see more and more software built this way. Um, that said, it's not a universal problem. So to make a concrete example, if you're working on a, a product like Facebook and you're collecting messages, you know, if in almost all cases, you know, if you see a message, it's durable, it's probably not going to be deleted. So you don't really have conflicts or deletions. And where you do have potential for this is where you have that kind of more elaborate structure that's, that's interactive and, and editable. Um, yeah, also, the uh, decentralized <coughs> web people uh, they just published some decentralized design patterns. I literally just came out yesterday and I was preparing for this, finishing my slides for this talk, so I haven't had a chance to look at it yet. But there are groups based out of Berlin. Uh, Simply Secure, I think, is one of the design firms that's working on this. Um, I'll tweet something about it once I find the link, uh, just to amplify it. So if you want to see more of their work, I haven't had a chance to look at it, but I know some of the people working on it, and I think there's going to be good work. Thanks. That's, that's great. Yeah, the, the example I was sort of thinking of was where you've maybe, um, it was the, the Lang thing, right? Where you, you're maybe typing in a tile or something, and uh, that's in a view that you're looking at, and somebody, you know, some, some changes get merged that mean that that tile is now somewhere else. Uh, and yeah. maybe disappears from in front of you. That's got to be pretty annoying. Maybe you get taken where it's gone. I don't know. But yeah, it's, yeah it's great. I, so I think anecdotally, the reason it doesn't happen is that um, most, and again, this is sort of discovered, most documents have one or two primary authors who are aware of their collaborators' activities and are mindful about it sort of innately. And I really, I really expected this to be more annoying, but I can't think of a time when that's actually happened to me you know, right. using this software as we have. Cool. OK, thanks, Peter. <laughs> You're welcome. Other questions? Yeah, um, I actually have one question, uh, Peter, is um, what are some good examples of local first software? Yeah, uh, there are quite a few cases of local first software. And you know, I've, I've kind of presented this like manifesto style, like here are the, the seven laws, you know, nail it to the door. But uh, you know, it, it really is a spectrum. And if you think about it, at one end, you have like the React Native app where all your data lives in the server. And like, as soon as the, you put your phone into airplane mode or turn off the Wi-Fi, everything disappears. Uh, at the other end, you have things like Google Maps. And Google Maps, you know, one of the big problems is that you can do this, but most people don't because it's expensive to do to the degree of sophistication and thoroughness that Google Maps has. But if you're a regular traveler, you'll know that, you know, with Google Maps, you can actually like, select an area of the map and say, I want to save this, I want to keep this for later. Um, you know, a few notches back towards the sort of uh, onlineiness, you can find Google Docs, uh, which is a case where, you know, yes, technically it has an offline mode, but you have to opt into it. And you know, in my personal experience, there's like a 100% chance that you think you have a document saved offline until you, know, you get on the airplane and you open your laptop to edit it, and then it's gone. Um, Git is a great piece of offline local first software. GitHub is not. Again, you know, you, you get on the plane, you go to open up your laptop and like hack on something on the plane and you realize, yeah, I've got the code, but all of my GitHub tabs have now got the little like, you know, dinosaur on them. Uh, so it is a spectrum uh, for sure. Um, Apple Notes, you know, Apple, Apple and mobile phones generally have done a better job of this than desktop software or things that we use on our laptops because the developers of those things are more aware of these problems. And like the core first party apps from uh, the hardware teams and, and the OS teams tend to take these things more seriously. And I think we can all do a better job both as a tools community of building tools to make that easier to do well and as a developer community to consume them. I don't, I don't know about the, okay, maybe they've done a better job at Apple. And I'm an Apple user, I love Apple, but I don't know. I've I've had some issues myself. 
still. Oh yeah, well, and we all have, right? I mean, this is the reality of the the kind of environment we're in. I thought I saw maybe. It... Oh, just people feeling sad about losing their data. Yeah. Yes. Yes. That's the way of the world. Uh, I have a question. Uh, why doesn't peer-to-peer -peer networking work very well? Oh, great question. And we can talk for, uh, about this in depth. Um, let's see. There's a long, there's a long answer. Uh, but the short answer is that we ran out of IPv4 addresses. Uh, and I'll explain a little bit more. Um, long, long ago in the days of uh, ARPANET, DARPANET, you know, the network, every computer had a public IP address that all other computers could reach. And you were either on the network or you weren't. And, you know, if you had a home PC, you didn't have a network connection. What you would do is use your modem and dial into a computer that had a network internet connection. And over time, as we started to bring, you know, computers home and have network connections, you know, internet connections in our house, we started to, one, exhaust the IP address space. We also discovered that maybe there were some security challenges to having every computer always being completely naked to the internet uh, so anyone in the world could reach them. And so we introduced Wi-Fi routers and firewalls and network address translation and all these kinds of things. And so that kind of defensive position led to uh, basically most home computers and computers just generally in a lot of environments don't really have a publicly accessible IP address. So the challenge then of peer-to-peer -peer software is how to tunnel from my computer to your computer when we're both behind these firewalls and routers. And in particularly in sort of libraries, universities, and corporate environments, you have clever network administrators who have customized things in their own ways to maximize the sort of security. And this peer-to-peer -peer software is often a casualty of that process. They lock things down and say, oh, no inbound connections. And so there's various tricks that things like WebRTC, Skype, and other kind of uh, tools, UPnP, NAT traversal, tunneling, hole punching, the whole sort of uh, rogues gallery of techniques you can use to try and get past this. But at the end of the day, there are still situations where you just can't get a, a packet from one computer to another without a third computer helping. Okay, thanks. <clears throat> yeah, I was going to ask about Skype because Skype, um, there's corporate, quite a lot of corporate, well, a fair number of corporates, the one I'm at at the moment, use, use Skype. Uh, and they have a very controlled environment. So I don't know if that's like a non-peer-to-peer -peer version of it or it's the business version of Skype. You've, you've got it in one. Uh, so the, the secret is that Skype, uh, actually Skype was invented, uh, created originally by a team out of Estonia who had originally made Kaza, which was a peer-to-peer -peer file sharing uh, service, which eventually got the creators sued by the record industry. Um, and the, Skype inherited a lot of that kind of peer-to-peer -peer approach. And that was especially valuable in the early days when yeah. network bandwidth was expensive. And so you know, it's still expensive in aggregate. But uh, the answer is basically that Skype provides something called turn servers. They're proxies. They're relay, relay servers, which carry sort of the 20% of the, uh, the traffic that you can't get otherwise. And the, the interesting thing in our research that we've been trying to figure out is basically you know, okay, well, if Skype goes out of business, if Microsoft says, now nah, we're done working on Skype, you know, go find a new vendor, all of that will go away. And then you're out of luck. So now what, right? So what we've been researching at the lab is trying to find ways to improve kind of the long-term, long-now resilience of software so that, well, if there, are, you know, we know that sometimes we need those other computers, but could any other computer volunteer? Could you just you know, throw any copy of the software on a computer that does have an IP before address, and it will basically volunteer and join that network, or you could ask it to, in ways that don't require you to stand up Postgres databases and Kafka servers and, you know, big cloud steel and a whole, you know, Kubernetes deploy and all that kind of nonsense. We make that a lightweight process. And, you know, we've made some progress there. It is presumably also useful to have uh, a permanently on machine somewhere, because uh, it yeah. might be, we want to communicate yeah, it, with it, not right now. The idea the idea is not that we should abandon the cloud. The cloud is great and the internet is great and network servers are great. The idea is that those things should not dominate our experience and be mandatory at all times for us to do anything. You always wanna have your data hosted off your computer. You might drop your laptop off a cliff somewhere and lose it, right? So you wanna have backups. But what you don't want is for 
that to be the server and you to be the client, right? It's the relationship that's broken, not the, not the network topology. You want that to be a peer. You want that to be an assistant, not a, not a master. 